and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. A man getting up at the ass end of the mo of the morning where he is, because time zones are the bane of my existence. And um, and the man behind the man behind Parcelings, which is not which is now getting its full on se setting expansion in the form of Nominal City, currently on Indiegogo. The one and only Leo, better known as Blue Two Days. Hey, hello, guys. hello. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It is Friday, the greatest day in the world, unless you're a fish. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. It's good to be on the weekend. Mm -hmm. It definitely is good to be on the weekend. Well, weekend, but, yeah. weekend for you. Yeah, weekend for me, start of the weekend for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, sorry, you go. Yeah, last, last I, it's been quite a while since the last time I had you on was when there was the early talk regarding Parsling's avarice. Mm, um, mm, mm. And now you're, now you're returning with, you're returning with not just a relaunch of Parsling's in the form of Indiegogo, but also Nominal City, which, if I'm not mistaken, is, is meant to, Nominal City is meant to be the setting book. Yeah, more or less. So, originally I wanted to do a setting included in the core rulebook, but I found that if I did so, I'd probably be hitting about 250, 300 pages, and that was a hell of a lot of pages to do in the first book. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, again, it was like... I always had the story in mind, like, the story's been there for a while, but in terms of my capabilities, when I first started um, in the tabletop sector, it was a little bit beyond me. Um, so it's good to come back a couple of years and take a look and see what, what I can do now, as opposed to what I could do back then. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Nominal City is the tale of sort of like ground zero of where the puzzling... Um, I guess, phenomenon really took off. Like, Parslings had already been around for a little while by that point, um, but this is the point where it kind of hits the public consciousness, where things start getting a bit wild, a bit, a bit kooky, because more and more people are um, infected by the, these parasites, and the magic is suddenly run wild in the populace, and that causes a lot of havoc. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so essentially for those that don't know what parsings is, um, parsings are individuals that have been affected by a magical parasite, and that gives them words. These words respond to who they are as a person, how people see them. And when you bring these words together with an another parsings um, words, you can make magic happen. So what does the phrase cold shoulder mean to you? Well, it's an well, it's a it is a idiom that is that is about ignoring someone who's ta who's talking to you. Yep. So, if we had a parsing with the word cold and shoulder, we could make magic to make someone ignore you. Um, say you need to sneak around the corner and you did, or you want to avoid your boss, you could make that happen. Mm -hmm. Or you could go with um, cold, um, shoulder cold. And be able to, to be a bit more resistant to cold. But you'll be able to bear it a little bit better, as in to shoulder a burden or shoulder the cold in this case. Um, and the phrases are all about context and how you decide to use them as people. Now, imagine a population of people that don't know the rules and people that are experimenting wildly with their magic, with these powers. Uh, you can imagine how much chaos that will bring, right? Mm. So, Nominal City tells, gives players and GMs a lot of information about a city, a setting that they can use to start their story, um, as well as a lot of little handy um, rumors and story, story hooks for the GMs to use. Mm -hmm. It's all about getting that first campaign off the ground, 
and not having to think too much about what the world is like. Yeah. Now, when I first had you on, when when we were t- when Parslings was mm. its original crowdfund, um, I remember you name dropping Mage in t- in um, terms of what some of its inspirations were, but. I forgot to ask this at the time, so I may as well ask it now. Has anyone brought up Unknown Armies to you? No, I haven't heard about Unknown Armies. Um, Can you tell me a little bit more about it? I will try my best to to summarize Unknown Unknown Armies. Um, But it is it 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 is a odd duck among among that style of urban fantasy. Hmm. Um, it is sometimes been nicknamed Cosmic Bum Fights. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Leans a bit into horror and occult. It is the it is the brainchild of Greg Stoltz, a name that I'm I'm sure you're I'm sure you'll be familiar with to a bit. A little bit, yeah. Um, you basic you basically have. It it has a lot of parallels with World of Darkness in terms of that whole group, um, occult organizations working under the surface for their own agendas kind of thing. Mm, mm, um, mm. But the thing, but it it but um a a lot there is a lot of emphasis on magic, but the magic styles aren't in. Are far removed from the traditional sense. In fact, I'd I'd be hard removed to fi- I'd be hard pressed to find any magic style in Unknown Armies that that it, that does that. Um, yeah, gotcha. one of the things that drew it that drew it to me in my early days was the fact that it does that. Um, your you don't have that the idea of tracking your overall health, whether it be through wounds or hit points. Is done in a far more broad sense by the GM rather than being tracked by the players. Hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. And because of that, because of that, it do, because of that, because of how how ridiculous it can get, though not nearly as ridiculous as Mage could get. That's where it's gotten the nickname um, "Cosmic Bum Fights." Hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Because like what I'm reading on like the wiki page is still like there's a, there's like half a dozen essentially gods that made the world, and you're acting as pawns to their role, and you're sort of fighting on their behalf. That is one. That is one of the other things. Oh. Hmm. Which I'm su- I'm surprised I'm surprised nobody else has brought up um, unknown armies to you in this regard. Well, I think at least in the tabletop sector, everyone's sort of usually they're hooked on D and D, and it's in different circles. Different things are more prominent, but no, no one's ever actually brought up unknown armies to me. Well, when it comes to speaking of mage, mm. if you go if you go back and look at most of the World of Darkness books. You'll usually find some smattering of different organizations, each with their each with their own agendas, um, mm. and I'd say I'd say for a lot of people that the World of Darkness, par- Darkness, <laughs> there's 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 a Freudian slip I've ever heard one. World of Darkness um, didn't invent, but certainly helped push forward the idea of emphasizing faction play in in a given setting. Mm-mm-mm. Is the is the idea of fa- is the idea of faction play something that is going to that is going to be a factor in Nominal City? Oh, absolutely. Um, at, at least within the book, we mentioned about four different factions. Um, the Fairbrooks, uh, which is this giant pharmaceutical company that have sort of discovered parslings and they're researching what the limits of parsing um, can do. Um, they're kind of new people to the town. They've been buying up a lot of real estate. They've been um, taking over um, essentially the, the city and knocking down parts of it and rebuilding it in their image. 
And then we've got the old families, which is the folk. And the folk are sort of like these old ghost shamans that have lived in um, Nominal City forever. And they're sort of been they've been co- keeping the p- parasites and parsings and the whole magical side of things hidden from most people um, and exploiting it to their own gain. Um, so they're very much against Fairbrooks and they're kind of in this con- of like this sort of semi feud between the two um two groups. Um and then we have Law, which is a group of I guess youths that have discovered um discovered parcelings on the well, parasites on their own. And they've been they act as free runners, they act as couriers, they kinda of travel all over the city and they've been experimenting wildly with their powers. And then finally we've got the N C P D, which is the Nominal City Police Department. And these people, there's like a sort of special division within them that are used to dealing with parsing threats just because they are sort of called in to, you know, deal with the problems of the citizens. Um, the thing is with the NCBD is that a lot of them are, are quite underpaid. And so their loyalties kind of waver between whoever is the highest bidder. Um, so we do have these four kind of factions and they, and they form the basic society structure of the Parsling secret um, secret communities. And they, I guess, they're a starting point for people to go into. And people are definitely more than welcome to use their own factions. But these are the ones where we've had a lot of stories planned for them. Yeah. And one of the, I think one of the other things that is is a hard is a hard grasp for a, for a lot of people mm. is for for one the um the team the team based word word casting as we've as we talked about in the past um mm. since it's def it's definitely far removed from the fire and forget way that a lot of people look at magic but I'd say the other I'd say the other thing that might that might be tricky for for some to grasp not grasp, but um, wrap their head around the, in the same way is the is the idea of the parasects and how they how they might appear in their characteristics. Mm-hmm. As, um, yes, since you're you dealing since you're dealing with a monster that is more of a concept than what a lot of people would consider a monster to be. Mm-hmm. So. At least the past side, they're sort of like the base bacteria level, um, bacteria level kind of organism. They they kind of swarm and they aggregate into like this pool of inky liquid. Um, but they've got a couple of routes that they can take in terms of, I guess, progressing what they are. Um, they can either um, infect a human, and that human becomes a parsling, or they can infect an animal. And when it hits an animal. Um, at least in this universe, the animals don't have quite the same sense of self as we do, and the parasite feeds on this identity, the, the way that people perceive it. And so what it does is it sort of consumes the animal and becomes this thing called a lingua. And the lingua um, takes on the traits of the animal as well as other things that people associate with that animal. So, for example... Oh, give me an animal. Give me a, give me an animal. Well, give, given where, given where I come from, um, let's go with the wolf. The wolf. Okay. So we can describe the wolf as the hungry wolf, the strong wolf, the the swift wolf, um, the lone wolf, and depending on what kind of wolf we associate, um, the wolf was before the parasite invaded and turned it into a lingua, um, we get different kinds of words. So if we had the hungry wolf, the hungry wolf would probably take on the appearance of more of like a skeletal kind of like a starving wolf. And the things it could eat are the things that a wolf could normally eat, but also anything that could be considered hungry. So if you were hungry, you'd be on the wolf's menu. And it would continue to consume and eat these things until it gets bigger and bigger, until it gets really strong enough to gain its own sort of intelligence. And the lingua form the backbone of what enemies can be in parsings, but there's also a lot of problems with the parsings themselves. So when a parsing dies, um, they sort of the parasite inside of them is not ready to kind of give up. 
And what happens is, is, they, is that they sort of try to resurrect the body based on what they remember of the host. And mm -hmm. since they've been eating the sort of words that have been on the host. So when a part site's tattoos um, are formed, that's just sort of like the part site saying, I want you to be this because you're already this and I want to feed on that concept to grow stronger. And so what it does is that when a, a character dies, they can become something called an incoherent, um, as I've mentioned, an incoherent. Um, so they become this kind of twisted monster based on one sort of word. Um, my favorite one is the concept of malaise. And this is mentioned in the core cool rulebook. So malaise essentially is an incoherent that feeds on the idea and things that represent malaise. So headaches, vomiting, nausea, pain, discomfort. And it both eats those things and in turn causes those things and causes the absence of those things because it eats them. So the way um, malaise worked was that she be um, she became sort of this um, super typhoid Mary where she spread diseases, she spread all the symptoms around and she would in turn eat these diseases to get stronger. So when she left the area, she actually left people that the people that survived more healthy than they were before. Um, and that, that's the basic concept of incoherent. And there's obviously the easy incoherence of like elemental natures. So if you could describe someone as maybe a bit airy, they'd eat a things um, related to air. So they'd get air-based powers, but also around them, there'd be a noticeable lack of air, if that makes any sense. So the incoherence is meant to embody the, the word so much that no one else can be that word, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, it, kind of, the, kind of the polar opposite of mm. the um, of the combined words approach that parslings mm. have. Yeah, it's all about them. It's all about you. It's all about um, incoherence is supposed to be the twisted representation when someone chases an ideal too far, um, and they just become less of a person and they become more of a caricature. Caricature. And they become very flat, and they become very much this creature of immense power, but it's very difficult for them to interact with anyone else in a normal fashion, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I'm guessing that, thro that throughout the Nominal City Guide, there will be, ex be examples of different types of parasites and, inco and incoherence that can be used as a base. Um, we went more of the route of we've given a bunch of little stories for people to hook on to um, and we've given them bits and pieces of potential interesting things that are happening around the city um, with characters with their own passwords while leaving the ultimate fate of those characters up to the players and GMs. Um, so, for example, in the depths of the library, um, um, Granfell Library, uh, which is basically a city library, more or less. Um, the history of Parsons have been recorded, but within these books, Parsites have taken root, and they form these like little, I guess, word butterflies that sort of eat away at the stories. Um, I, I guess you could call them book words, you could call them book flies, you could call them a whole bunch of things. And the idea is that they're waiting for enough of a person to latch onto and eventually infect and become part of them and also maybe eat people's stories. Um, so yeah, there, there are definitely creatures in, um, included in, this, in the book. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, mm. given the fact that this is take, that this is all taking place in one city, mm. um, I'm guessing that you plan that you plan on on filling that out with different districts with their own little identities. Yes, very much so. Um, currently, there are about six or seven districts from the top of my head that have been listed, um, and each of them with their own kind of distinct um, personality. So, um, Nominal City is supposed to be like Hong Kong, supposed to be like Malaysia, supposed to be like Singapore. Um, it's this sort of metropolitan. Bizzling, um, bustling business hub where a lot of cultures mix and kind of, um, I guess, meld together. It's very much a westernized Asian city, if um, that makes any sense. 
it's it's interesting even even with even with that the given that you mentioned that i'm get i'm guessing that there's a bit more there's a bit of a claustrophobic vibe with mm -hmm. the, with the with the way, with the way that it's set up i'm not saying that it's full on kowloon wild wild city even though that would be a very fascinating place to do to run a campaign <laughs> mm. uh, but just ev everybody a whole a whole lot closer and a whole lot of people um, getting meshed together in this one area. Yes, very much so. It, it, there's like multiple parts of the city that are very crowded, especially more so since um, there's been a lot of construction caused by Fairbrooks. Um, Fairbrooks. And so what's happening here is that people are sort of being pushed into this one dense um, area like called... Uh, I'm just trying to remember what it's called. Yeah, the Gator. Um, and it's sort of like this... Or at least for now, it's sort of like this kind of slum of people that can't really get out of each other's way. And if you're puzzling, you're probably going to get found out really, really soon. Just because you're in this district and that there are so many people right next to you that you can't help but bump into them and potentially get glimpses of their words. Um, and this contrasts greatly with Fairbrooks, um, the Fairbrooks district, which is sort of this high-tech area that's under construction, but it's building up, it's getting better. It's actually like the proper, like the prim and proper part of town where everyone's, everything's going well. Um, eventually, they do plan to sell these um, houses back to the people at a low cost, but they're expanding and they're causing problems with downtown, which is sort of like mm, an area where a lot of old buildings have been retrofitted with new tech. So imagine like really f um, pretty architecture mixing with neon signs and air conditioning units that don't seem quite to seem to fit into the buildings itself. And then obviously we've also got the upper class area, which is um, the Golden Shores and the Plateau Island. And this is like the where old money sits. This is where all the artisanal, artsy, craftsy, the very hip and very um, art-focused area is. And it's sort of like um, this golden paved area, a lot of really pretty old apartments and a lot of old families that reside there. And they're selling all the pottery, they're selling all the traditional arts um, there. And it's very much a different atmosphere from the other areas that I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. And we've got Old Town, which is sort of like the place that the city forgot. It's the ruins of the former um, harbour. And it's kind of gone into disarray. It's where a lot of squatters live. It's where the law frequents because they get to experiment without too much intervention from the rest of, uh, rest of the people. And it's like this area near the mountains where we can go up and have our own adventures there. So there's a lot of different kinds of districts within the city. And a lot of each one are try to give their own characteristics, their own personalities. So that if you start there, the story feels different um, than if you had started somewhere else. Now... With that, with that in mind, uh, part of the part of the reason that I asked about districts is obviously establishing the identity of nominal of nominal city. Mm. And, I'm and to that end, I'm guessing that both both the parts of the city as well as the major factions have their movers and shakers who will who could potentially be used as NPCs in a give in a given campaign mm -mm -mm. within the book. We do make mention of them, um, but the plan was to eventually spread out into their own personal books just to expand them out a little bit more. So we do give examples, but we don't give like the big boss names because in any given story, how likely are you... Uh, I guess it really depends on the group, whether you want to be involved with the big movers and shakers or you want to be slowly kind of muddling your way around because... Most of the campaigns that I've run, I've noticed that people don't really tend or gravitate towards those really big hitters. Not at the start, at least. And this is supposed to be an introductory area, where which we will expand on in later iterations. Now, 
with that with that kind of thing in mind, mm. um, do you have plans to put and to put any manner of um, sto- of short and long term story seeds within the book? Um, yes, most definitely. Um, at the back of the book, there's a whole bunch of um, short term story seeds that the um, GMs can start with and then meld to and use from their own. And we've been given little bits of hints of what is what is happening in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, that is definitely something that we're planning to. Well, that we've mostly done for now. But the focus was on the city itself. This in this book, the idea of giving the actual setting its own time to shine. Yeah. Now, when I when I saw the Indiegogo page, one thing that I found kind of in, kind of interesting was that. This is being presented not only not only just as the presentation of the nominal city guide, but also a reintroduction of the parceling um, system. Mm. Um, is what was the reason you was the reason you're going by that by that route because of the fact that this is your first campaign on Indiegogo and wanting to introduce the whole of it um, proper. Well, it's like the difficulty with, I guess, running your own little setting is that you're always trying to reach out to new people. And the reason why we did it the way we did was to kind of make sure that people understood what the game was about and didn't focus. I guess it was like, I'm just trying to think how to word this. Um, Very much so. It's all about making sure that people understood what the game was about and they and also trying to get more people playing Parslings because that's always the struggle with um, indie tabletop RPGs is getting enough of a community together to keep it self-sustaining. Mm-hmm. Um, while we have a lot of different campaigns happening um, that I'm aware of, uh, it's also it's really hard to introduce people to a new um, system and have them love it and play it forever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the Kickstarter needed to cover that base. I'm sorry, the Indiegogo needed to cover that base, and obviously, with the new platform comes a different bunch of a different set of audiences. Mm-hmm. Now, with the with that kind of thing, in, with that kind of thing in mind, there's one other there's one other book that was that. Was brought up, that was brought up in this, and that is Infra Memorial Station. Mm. So Infra Memorial Station is sort of like a very um, introductory session for GMs to run through. It's set on a train station. It's set on um, the concept of a locked train. So basically, it gives the GM a chance to set up a scenario where the players. Um, can't necessarily move to, in too many directions, and it makes it easier for them to experiment with the tools that they've got. It's sort of like um, when you run into a video game, you give them a tutorial stage, right? Um, and it sort of prevents them from going too far off track, but also gives them a taste of everything that is possible in the game. So in the scenario book, you kind of face a lingua, you face an incoherent, and you talk about, and you sort of understand the world and how the game um, run so it gives a lot of hints and guides to um, hints and tips to users on how to play puzzles, like what kind of checks to make, what kind of um, tasks to ask to do, and it's supposed to give you a very good idea of how the game actually runs um, in a free form setting. And now I'm, gu- I'm guessing that you, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that you have even even in a virtual sense run your run your fair share of um of sample adventures with parcelings. Hmm. Now, uh, yeah. Given th- given that what because of how different of a game even by even by indie RPG standards parcelings is. Um what are some things that in your in your opinion people took to re- rather easily and what were some things that what were some concepts that some people had a bit of difficulty um ha- a bit of difficulty adapting to 
right, so over the course of the entire playtest history of Parslings, I've probably run for at least 400, maybe more than that, people by now. Um, and that probably equates to over 100 sessions. So um, people generally take really well to the card system once they get it. It takes a little bit of... It takes them a couple... So in terms of what people found really interesting and easy to um, work with is the tabletop, the the card-based mechanics. So the idea that you've got hearts, you've got um, you've got suits that represent what kind of actions you're taking, and you've got um, numbers which add to the successes. People take to that segment pretty easily, like the first five minutes. But the thing that takes some people a bit longer is the freeform magic. The idea that you can do anything you really want um, given um, um, if you have the appropriate words. Some people found it really easy and they found it really intuitive to do, but then some people um, found it a little bit of a struggle. And the idea is that if you have people that do struggle, um, the players at the table who have ideas are able to help guide them and teach them of how to work. So it, the whole sense of collaborative magic really helps, um, really helps the fact that, I'm oh, sorry, the collaborative magic aspect really helps the freeform nature of parses. So it's not down to one person to describe what they want to do. It's like magic by council. So it definitely is very much a different experience from most games. Like Mage, I've played a couple of games of Mage. I've played a couple of games of Genius the Inspired. And my issue always was that some people just didn't have... A good, what, a good idea of what they wanted to do or how they wanted to achieve it. They knew what the goal was, but they could never come up with the ideas. And it was always a response from a lot of players that they were trying to hold back their ideas and try not to take over the other player. But in Parslings, it's sort of like a two-way communication. You get to talk to them, and it doesn't feel that you're kind of taking over someone's um, limelight. You're sort of working with them to create the limelight for the both of you. Um, so it's that core... Cool, it, people find the cooperative nature of the magic usually very interesting. Um, but it does take a lot of maturity as players to come to a consensus. Now, when it, com when it comes to the magic, I've, I, I remember when I was going through it, and I had a bit of a theory in the back of my head, because mm. um, for a bit of context, I've, I've gone on record saying that the quote-unquote most ubiquitous role-playing game um, is n may d could could be argued as a good way to introduce because of the, because of that ubiquitousness, but it could but it could also create some bad ha some bad habits. Um, and I've had I've had a bit of a I've had a bit of a theory that those who have le who have less tabletop experience, mm -hmm. um. But had but had more experience in other forms of fantasy fiction, whether that be through stuff like the Dresden Files or stuff or stuff like mm. Mistborn, um, mm. had an easier time getting into the magic system versus those who had who had been playing um, ta one for one form or another of tabletop RPGs more than others. Is oh. that something that you ended up seeing, or was that not the case? Honestly, it was a big mix. Like. Yes, the people that people that never played tabletops uh, before, when they came in, they were like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" And they definitely did shine to it. Um, they were they learnt the rules a lot faster than say people that had been ingrained in one specific tabletop RPG, and they had constantly been comparing the game to their own. Um, tabletop um, that they played, so they were constantly making references to other D and D stuff or, or World of Darkness stuff, and it definitely did change uh, based on players' experience. It did change how they initially received the game, if that makes any sense. Because some people that play, I don't know, like a tactical turn-based combat RPG, um, they're very focused on killing. They're very focused on taking people down, and they're they usually switch off after their turn is over, as you might notice in some games. Oh, yes. Where, <laughs> whereas the people that came in, 
that were experiencing tabletops for the first time and that were drawn in by the bright colors and pretty pretty nature of the game they were very much more explorative they they went for more i i guess less um i guess they went for more free form answers such as like oh can i do such and such to get out of this situation or can i talk to the monsters or can i try befriend the monsters that sort of thing and it really did show how um the, they did really shape how the table responded to the game because, again, it's a very much more of a freeform experience. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. Um, and it's not like, oh no, there are specific rules to stop you from doing something, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, yes, there was very much a distinct difference between those who had played tabletop RPGs before and those that had not. I, I think the people that were interested in tabletop, um, playing tabletop RPGs and were d was treating Pilesings as their first game found it a lot more enjoyable than those who were expecting one type of game and came in and played one um, the game that they, want, um, they are used to playing, but they eventually came around. Yeah. And when I bring this kind of thing up, it's not even about... Um, about how similar or different it is to, to the game that they're used to playing, because most people are are one system life are one system lifers. Obviously, I I'm not <laughs> I'm not clearly I'm but I know mm. that I am a rare unicorn in that regard. But <laughs> it is more it is more about the re the reason why I brought that up is is more on how people are willing. to willing to accept when something doesn't fit within the narratives of of what a tabletop yeah. RPG should be cuz mm. a lot of pe a lot of people when they think of a TTRPG they're going to think of dice. Yep. And your system is primarily mm. card focused. Mm. Uh, and I and I've seen people turn their noses up at games that use cards or game that use or games that use what could be collectively called non-standard methods of randomization, uh, whether it be yep. cards or custom dice. Although mm. the ultimate irony, um, I got, I got, yeah, I got yelled, at, I got, um, I got some shade thrown at me by a guy who plays Fate about the fact that I was running Genesis at the time with its weird dice. And I'm like, <laughs> you run Fate. Fate uses fudge dice. You got no room to talk. Yeah. Um, sorry, you can move on. But just the, and the and in that in that same vein, um, if they're used to a game that that is combat focused, well, I'm pretty sure with something like Parslings, you could probably lean into combat fo into a combat focused campaign. But that but it's but um that would be underselling the totality of it. Hmm. Well, I guess it's like whenever you plan a session, whenever you plan a game, you need to sort of know the table that you're playing. And if we're running at a convention, I don't know who I'm going to get on any given day. So the idea is to have a little bit of combat, but also show the players that there are other ways of solving the problem besides combat. Yeah, um, I, um, I mm. usually write, I usually write out a one or two page primer that just mm. that just gives the gist of the campaign. The tone, the tone that I'm going for, and what would be, what what would be suggestions to lean into. Um, mm. I did that once um, a couple years ago when I was running Lex Arcana, and mm. for a yeah, one for a one shot at the time, and I had I had put in that primer. Do not make do not make a combat he do not make a combat heavy character. Otherwise you're get otherwise you're going to be sitting on your hands. Through a good amount. This is going to be investigation focused. I'm not yep. saying that you can't you can't make a combat heavy character. Just know that there's going to be consequences. Yep. Um. And in that in that same in that same vein, the reason why I say that going combat heavy would would be would be underselling is because there's multiple there's multiple ways to do to do it. I I look at Nominal City as, and and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, as a sandbox. Yes, very much so. A 
a sandbox that you can use to tell a variety of stories instead of one particular one. Mm. That is correct. That definitely is correct. It's definitely not shaped for any one type of story, but rather the basis to form any kind of story that you'd like in a modern setting. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely feel that with parsings, you can sort of be whatever you want in the team, and you will be able to get through most situations by virtue of how the magic works. If you do have combat characters, obviously you can do combat, but for people that have chosen to make less combative characters, they still have amazing capabilities. And it's not like attack and smash is always the right answer. Often talking, often looking for clues and finding an alternate way out is the way to go. Like, the easier way to go. In fact, sometimes combat is very much the punishing route. No satisfying. It um, usually ends up causing more problems to you logistically in the long term. So um, the way the game works is with the decks of cards, um, as... As you get hurt, as you get hit, you start to lose cards in your deck, you know, to representing your loss of function. And so if people enter to combat a lot, they'll find that their HP, their, their, their effective HP will be dropping um, as the game goes along. And it also cuts off the ability to pull off feats. And it kind of reminds people that this is a fairly harsh world. It's very much, you get hurt and it's not like, you can still fight 100% effectively, um, like in D&D, &D, where you've got, oh no, I've lost, I'm on 1 HP, but I'm still um, hitting my max dice ball. Um, my, you know, my maximum capability. Um, it's more like, oh no, I'm 1 HP, I need, and all my cards, all my clubs are gone. I need to start either talking my way out of things, running away, or using magic. Mm. And so it, it sort of creates this natural progression of what the players think because with um the deck of cards that you, they use um is made of regular playing cards obviously mm -hmm. um but it's like 15 cards so card counting is very easy so the players are very much aware of when they can actually push for something physical where or they should be maybe relying on their words or trying to think their way out of the box mm -hmm. this it, this natural um progression of card county lets the narrative flow change and it also does put a bit of a use stress on the players to think differently um and it sort of enhances the idea that you can't always do one type of gameplay it allows a lot of characters to shine in different ways when the sit the tables are turned yeah now one thing that i've noticed over the years with uh, with um games especially especially with the popularization, I guess I'll put it, of Session Zero. Just mm -hmm. something that I th something that I think a lot of people were doing, they just didn't have a name for it until <laughs> until a few years ago. Yeah. Um There are some there are some there's some set there's some games and some setups that are that um best have their character creation when it's a when it's a group thing. It's a kind of character creation that doesn't quite work in isolation, mm. uh, where everybody everybody is just off making their own character sheet, making their own character on sheet, and until the until the session day, or in my case, doing a set of one on ones with each of my players. But and then th and then there are some that are be that are best handled all at once. Um, Cipher, I think I think is a good example of that kind of thing because a lot of the story beats involve asking and answering questions based on the players to the right or the, or the left of the table. Mm. Um where do you see where do you see parcelings in that kind of thing? Do you see do you see it as one where character creation is best when it's handled in a group? Or I definitely think I think character creation has to be handled in a group. Mm. Um because the way that the words for any character are driven um are cre uh, found is that you sort of come to session zero, you tell a story about your character, you sort of get people to think about your character, and they're meant to fill out like a table of words that could be your character's potential words, and then you roll from it. So the idea is that you're getting some words from yourself, you're getting some words from your GM, you're getting some words from the player next to you. And it creates a more authentic experience, because as much as you can try to control how people perceive you, 
in in real life, it doesn't always work out. So someone that could be well dressed, well presented, could be seen as prim and proper, or they could be seen as a prude. Now, the way that these words work are very different to each other, as you might um, understand. Like, prim and proper is a good thing, whereas prude is more of a negative thing. So the idea is that with Session Zero, the players get invested and they start thinking about each other's characters. So they're actually more aware that of um, who they're playing with rather than a D&D game where it's it simply boils down to, oh, you're an elf, you're a barbarian. That's what you do. It is a bit more nuanced than that. Mm-hmm. So I think Session Zero is a must for Parslings. And it's very much about the characters rather than the mechanics. That's the, the focus of the game is the identity of who you're playing. So it is, Session Zero is definitely one of the most important things to this game. It's one of the, the most fun activities because you're actually not just sitting there making stats. You're sitting there talking and thinking about each other's characters, thinking about stories and feeding GM, the GMs a lot of different pieces that they can use to form the story around your character. And I, I can certainly get behind that. Um, <laughs> now, what are, you shoot, what are you shooting for as... Before I even get to what you're shooting for, something I couldn't help but notice is the fact that the bo- the book has more of a horizontal appearance on the in- on the Indiegogo page. Um, are you setting this? Are you setting this up to to have a different have a different layout than a standard book, or was that just um, yeah. was that just a placeholder? Yeah. No, no, it's definitely setting up for a different kind of layout for the book. So um, it's an a5 so half of an a4 um and the book is designed to fold um downwards so top to bottom um you've got the top of the edge at one side and then uh, i'm not explaining this well um so yeah it is very much a horizontal format it's a different book format that i wanted to experiment with to see if it worked and it was just a bit of fun for me essentially um it's still it, it, it it allows for a lot of different illustrative um, and a lot of different text flows, which may be a little bit foreign to people. It's going to be interesting to see how it gets received. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for Nominal City and um, and, and for memorial, I know it's I know it says one hundred and thirty one respectively, but I also I also know that think that things can change from concept to fi- to final execution. Mm, let's take a look. I'm, I'm just taking a look at how many pages that actually ended up. I I think from memory, I definitely have hit the goal that I assigned the the one that I um had assumed. Um, because I've been very clear on my page limits, my word limits, and um, especially with the writers that are working with me, um, how much text we actually need. Um, give me a second to open up the document. It's one. Okay, here we go. So from what I've got right now, the pages, the page count. Ooh. Okay, that's not right. Um, the page now, yeah, page count right now sits at 118. Uh, we'll probably go maybe a couple more pages than that, um, just as we add in a little bit more content. So we definitely hit that page count, but as it's an A5 book, it's probably getting closer to I don't know, 60 pages A4, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. So it's 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 a decent sized book. It's something that you could read in like an afternoon quite easily and comfortably. Um, so, yeah, no, we, we went for a smaller book because, again, it's a lot of investment to make a full-blown 100-page, 200-page book. And, again, yeah. Alright, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Release window? Well, (sighs) I'm hoping to get it out by the end of July. Like uh, the P, at least the PDF version, mm-hmm. uh, due to shipping, printing, and COVID, um, it's impossible to accurately 
I guess, predict when the printing and shipping is done. But as for the most part, the writing, the text layout, the setup of the book is about 90% done. I just need to get through the last couple of illustrations and clean up a little bit of text, and then we should be done. But right now, I'm just inundated by a lot of things that I need to get done. <laughs> Life gets busy, you know? Oh, yeah. And I will be looking forward to seeing how that de how that develops. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. But with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness once again. Mm. Well, it, it's been a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for always inviting me to have these little chats. And... Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As gotcha, I often gotcha. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>